and welcome back to day two of Real Estate Live UK. Now, our programme of virtual events runs three times a year and are brought to you by White Label, our partners and sponsors. And a big thank you to all of the organisations that have contributed to the brilliant panels that we have taking place over the next three days. Now, over the course of today and tomorrow and yesterday, we are showcasing places and investment opportunities across the UK and industry leading experts will be exploring ideas and topical issues relating to property, including panels on sustainable stadiums, life sciences, social value and levelling up. Now, you can view the full programme of sessions taking place this week and register for any others that you're of interest. Uh, it's free to attend any of them by visiting our website now, which is realestatelive.co.uk. And several of our panels and presentations are also linked to our key themes for the February programme. And they are sustainability and biodiversity, inclusive communities and future infrastructure. Now, yesterday we visited Mid-Sussex and Croydon and also discovered the, discussed the future infrastructure needs of our local UK cities. Um, and today, um, and we also looked at how industry, industrial logistics can be delivered and supported in misuse developments. And you can watch any of the videos from yesterday on the website shortly. But today we're kicking off with our London keynote session and looking at how London can be inclusive in creating homes and communities. And just before we start, I'd like to remind everybody in the audience, please feel free to ask lots of questions using the Zoom's Q&A function and we'll do our best to get to them all and answer them. But now I'm pleased to hand over to our chair for this session, Maria abadouli Schwartz, she is CEO of Foundation for Future London. Over to you, Maria. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm um, pleased to be chairing this conversation. It's a really crucial one. Is London inclusive? What's the role um, that the real estate has in making sure that it is? And how do we meet the SDG goals? How do we make sure it's a capital um, that actually welcomes others, but also provides housing that's required, affordable housing, green spaces? I have um, a brilliant panel today, um, but first of all, we're going to start off with a pre-recorded video from Paul Scully, MP, who is a minister for London. And he's going to discuss some opportunities for London and how he thinks um, London needs to operate in regards to the pandemic and what he sees as the real estate role in levelling up and creating homes for everyone and how we support government and, I hope, the local authorities and local communities to make sure that happens. Hello all and good morning. I'd like to first of all extend a warm thank you to Real Estate Live, in particular Raj Single and Natasha Cobley for inviting me here today to talk about the government's housing plans for London. The government are committed to supporting London's economic recovery and helping the housing industry to build back better following the pandemic, so it's a pleasure to join you for today's event. There will no doubt be many of you here today who have felt the negative effects of COVID-19 on the real estate sector. Throughout the pandemic, the government has supported the housing industry by allowing construction sites to remain open, enabling delivery of 216,000 homes in England in 2020, 2021. And alongside this, a stamp duty holiday was provided for 15 months until September 2021 to keep the ha that housing market moving. What's clear though, is that there's an abundance of opportunities for London as we emerge from the pandemic. So as Minister for London, I want to ensure that the capital gets the funding it needs to boost our housing industry. So I'm proud to say that London has been earmarked for more than £9 billion from government to fund house building. £4 billion will come from the Affordable Homes Programme, increasing the number of affordable homes in London by 35,000. And that builds on a long history of delivery in the capital where since 2010, more than 119,000 affordable homes have been built with 81,500 of those available to rent. In addition to providing funding to supporting the housing sector, governments recognise that there also needs to be a focus on easing regulations around planning applications. So to help tackle this issue, we've introduced a new permitted development right, allowing for the change of use from a wider range of commercial to residential buildings without the need for planning applications. Through our levelling up agenda, the government's committed to creating a fair and just housing system that works for everybody and spreads that opportunity fairly. And that includes helping first time buyers in London access home ownership and providing more affordable and high quality homes. The recent levelling up white paper 
sets out our mission that by 2030, we'll have a, renters will have a secure path to ownership. By supporting house builders and first time buyers, we'll level up generation rent into generation buy. At the same time, it's imperative that the tenant population are not overlooked and remain protected. So the government have set a target of reducing the number of non-decent rented homes by 50% by 2030 across the country. In addition, we've supported businesses by announcing the commercial rent bill in November 2021. That bill will ring fence debt accrued due to enforced business closures and introduce a binding arbitration process to resolve arrears between landlords and tenants, supporting businesses as we can continue to recover from the impact of the pandemic. But just to finish, I want to reiterate that your continued advocacy for the importance the importance of a real estate industry is recognised and supported by the government. I believe that housing has a really key role to play in adding and aiding London's recovery and fulfilling our levelling up ambitions. So once again, I'd like to thank you all again for having me. So housing has a crucial role in the property sector and regeneration is absolutely crucial for London as it is in most cities. How do we make sure that happens? We have a brilliant panel of conversations and individuals with various backgrounds who we're going to just start with a conversation. Um, I'm going to start with Councillor Darren Rodwell. Um, and Cap Darren, if you don't mind, <laughs> um, I've got a question for you and that's about across London, um, What's, what's the ambition, and certainly for your borough, what's the ambition for creating inclusive um, places and homes? And how does that then also create jobs and all the other things that people need for a healthy, secure livelihood? Thank you very much, Marie, and it's lovely to be here today. And obviously with yourself, uh, it's good to see you well. Um, let's start with London as a whole. London as a place... Um, our TA issues are the equivalent population of Oxford. That's how many uh, families we have not in permanent accommodation. If we look at what London has been doing, and it's interesting to hear what um, Paul was saying, um, actually, it's absolutely key in the uh, rejuvenation after COVID um, that London gets back on its feet and starts building again. Now, I'm being a bit serious today, so I can only apologise for anyone who's heard me before, because this is a serious matter. London and its supply, basically, we need 7.6%, oh, sorry, 7.6 greater turnover of house build than we currently have. So we're just not building enough homes that normal Londoners can afford to either rent or, or in fact, normal Londoners can't afford to buy in London anymore. Let's be honest about it. In Barking and Dagenham, we are the cheapest borough. And even as a cheap, the cheapest borough, it's now 12 times someone's average salary in my borough to, to buy a property. So we, what we need to do, though, is take the stigma away from what people perceive renting is about. We need to give rights to renters which is long overdue. We have the only um, uh, private landlord, borough private landlord scheme in the country, which is which is not right at all. And I know that my colleagues who are on this call today, we would all agree that a private landlord scheme needs to be nationwide. But the actual build is, is where I'm really concerned because we can't build enough of what we need to allow London and new Londoners to come into the city. And that's really important because everything starts with the home. The skills shortage we now have um, is, is quite pronounced since Brexit. And it's, and it's something we've got to deal with. The cost of materials are extremely um, inflated right now. And it's something that we've got to try and get the supply chain right on again. And again, uh, I don't care how people voted in, in uh, referendums or, or anything, uh, in, but we've got to acknowledge 
that we have caused ourselves a few problems in this whole area. So it's about making sure we've got the right skills. It's about making sure we have the right supply chains. It's, again, right to make sure that everyone has a sense of place. Because bricks and mortar is just one part of the solution. The other part is hearts and minds. So I'm really clear that we do not have poor doors. We do not ha have poor areas of any kind because everyone is aspirational. Even if they don't want to buy their home, they're still aspirational. And we've got to make sure that across London that we build the homes that are required. Cross-subsidy now doesn't actually work in the way it once did, and it's making it very difficult. So the government, and I heard what, again, Mr Scully said, Paul said, but the truth of the matter is, at the moment, we are spending $23 billion a year on housing benefit. And he said himself, London's getting $9 billion for housing, to build new housing. Surely that's the wrong way around. Surely we should be looking at what we can do to build communities collectively. And that's really important. And as the leader of Barking and Dagenham, that's one role I have. And we've got one of the biggest house building programmes in London, uh, and especially affordable. We built 20% of London's affordable last year, uh, which is quite something. Um, but in my role as Deputy Chair and the Housing and Planning Lead for London Councils, uh, I want to make sure that all 32 boroughs and the city work together to make sure we build the homes that Londoners deserve, require and aspire to. Thank you, Darren. Some really interesting stats in that. Um, but I think you're right about ambition, what we want for people and places as well as the actual infrastructure. Um, I'd like to bring Councillor Grace Williams into the conversation. Um, Grace, would you tell us a little bit more about what you think the role of the council is and what it plays in delivering um, diverse housing across the borough and other boroughs? Thanks so much, Maria, and thanks, Darren. That was really, really uh, fascinating, and I couldn't agree more. So I'm really thrilled to be here with colleagues um, to discuss this issue, which I would say, um, as a leader, is sort of number one um, in our communities and really needs addressing. We have to be robust um, in our response to the housing crisis that Darren has talked about today. Um, when I became leader um, in the summer of last year, I set out my ambition to do even more on housing, to work with our communities and to work with partners um, so that we can deliver um, housing. You know, people having a decent roof over their head is a fundamental right. And I think that, you know, that's where it needs to start. You know, Darren has talked about the fact that uh, renting is so important. In our borough, we also have a private rented um, landlord scheme. Um, and in our borough, it's just absolutely vital. We have 39,000 private rented properties um, in the borough. So being able to regulate that and ensure high standards is very important. And I'm not convinced government really is getting to grips with what's needed there. You know, at the very least, we need a London-wide scheme because we know that landlords operate across borough boundaries. So 37% of our homes are private rented homes. Places do need to be mixed. They do need to be good places, as Darren has said. So a little bit more about what we're doing um, in Wolf and Forest and, and how councils need to operate. All councils need to recognise that we need to use what they're calling the business, a portfolio approach. You know, we need all kinds of housing if we're to deliver for all our residents. Um, you know, we need to make sure that we have a flexible approach to housing delivery. So what that means is um, to embrace a range of tenures, including build to rent, which is a really important part of the sector, alongside genuinely social and affordable housing. And we've made sure we have a really strong track record on the percentage of affordable housing. So we've delivered around 47% um, affordable housing. Um, it's also really vital to work with a broad range of investors and developers. Um, we've worked with Countryside, Hill Partnerships, Pocket Living, um, as well as high quality build to rent providers, um, such as Legal in General, for example. And this flexibility means that we ensure a wide, wide mix of diverse housing. So it really is about that complete focus on uh, partnership working with a range of developers. 
And it's also about setting up our own council housing development company. So in Waltham Forest, we have 60 bricks. It's a property development company. It's owned by the council and it's instrumental to, live, to delivering a diverse range of housing for us. It means we can set rents at social rent level and we can offer um, a much wider range of shared ownership purchase opportunities. And, you know, when I go and meet residents who've moved into these properties, they're, they're absolutely delighted. They're high quality. They're in areas that they want to live in. And what this means for us, I mean, we would love to have as much land as Darren. Um, and it really is amazing what they're able to deliver in Bath and Dagenham. We have a much smaller um, uh, land, uh, you know, ownership. 60 Bricks has a pipeline of approximately 700 new homes. And really that's gone from in the last four years, we were not building social homes. So 60 Bricks has allowed us to um, deliver that across um, uh, sites where we have 20 properties from, well, ranging from 20 properties to 120. So it is very much dotted around the borough on the sites that we own. But what it enables us to do is deliver a diverse range of housing that our residents need. Um, and I think there are two key levers to ensuring successful home delivery for us. So one is about relentlessly identifying and promoting opportunity areas. So small, medium, large scale development opportunities, working with the public and private sector. And the other one is about social and physical infrastructure. So, you know, how do we make sure that in delivering diverse housing, we can support um, social and physical infrastructure, you know, such as transport, um, and also our kind of active travel initiatives, rail station improvements. So really, in order to do what Darren's saying and kind of capture the hearts and minds of our residents, we have to make sure we are creating places where people want to live. We have to do, uh, you know, everything we can in relation to housing so that we can bring in the infrastructure benefits that we need. And just lastly, I'd say it's a really critical time um, for London, for the property sector and for regeneration um, coming out of the pandemic. So I really welcome the opportunity to share what we're doing in Waltham Forest, but also what other boroughs are doing and how we can work with the sector to keep delivering on those opportunities. Thank you, Grace. I mean, there is a need for collaboration, isn't there, between boroughs and making sure we get it right. So it's people, place and good homes. Um, Councillor Peter Mason, can I bring you in? Hello. Well, you're going to tell us a little bit more, I hope, about um, community engagements and the work that you're doing. Um, yeah, by all means. Look, um, uh, great to be here. Um, I think the exam question that I got set is how can the community be sort of more involved in the provision of housing um, and community facilities? And really, I, I start at the point of the challenge that we face sort of in a post-pandemic world in which so many of us have been sort of grounded in the communities that we um, have lived in uh, rather than work for so long. Um, no more heading off into the central activity zone for a substantial number of us over the last couple of years. Um, but that really reflects a period in which we've been seeing increasing levels of what you might term sort of urban unrest as people sort of see the consequences of an economy not quite working for them. Um, at, also at a time of hyperconnectedness and the way that technology is playing a role in bringing people together to share conversations and stories and to enable activism in a way that probably hasn't really um, happened, um, you know, had it not been for the internet and for, for social media platforms. Um, and all of that happens in a period of high level, uh, a period of uh, very high levels of unemployment. Ealing had at one point the highest number of people um, on furlough, and we continue to have the, four, the fourth highest number of um, people on, on in-work benefit. And therefore that sense that London's economy is not working for Londoners is a palpable feeling. Um, you only have to look at the east of our borough, an area that I represent, South or Green, that has average incomes of less than half that of the, um, the other um, uh, end of the borough. Um, I've got my points um, swap round, um, but it's half of that. Um, it's half of that of, of the other end of the borough. And there are huge inequalities that are equally mapped onto that. Southall um, is disproportionately a black, Asian and minority ethnic community, whereas Chiswick, with some of the highest salaries in our borough, um, is, is not. Um, and you only then have to look at health inequalities that map onto um, housing demand, areas of poor quality housing uh, and the highest uh, levels of housing demand 
women have 15 years um, less life expectancy. Um, and th these are real and understood pressures um, that people are feeling. Um, and partly, look, this is about London's greatest successes also being its worst enemies. We have a huge agglomeration of well-paid jobs in the central activity zone that ensure that, um, that uh, we take a huge collective appetite for infrastructure investment, invariably ensuring that in a place like Ealing, we send rich people off from their rich homes in central Ealing to rich tower blocks in the city on rich pieces of infrastructure like um, Crossrail. Um, and we send poor people on the um, 207 and the 94 to go and, and clean them. We, we are redistributing um, poverty um, to other parts of the city and to other parts of the country. We're not redistributing wealth. Um, and as Darren has already said, you know, this is not a crisis of housing delivery. This is a crisis of affordable housing delivery with high numbers of people in temporary accommodation, housing waiting lists as a symptom of low pay and exclusion from the housing market. Here's another stat for you. You know, 10% of the, the borough, borough's population um, are people of black and African backgrounds, yet they account for 24% of people in our um, uh, council houses and 27% of people on a housing waiting list. And that tells you something about institutional discrimination and um, structural um, inequalities. And I have to say, uh, listening to the Minister for London um, say that um, the government's trying to build um, a just um, and equitable housing market is a bit like listening to the Prime Minister tell us um, he didn't have any parties in uh, number 10 Downing Street. Um, because actually what we've seen from the government in terms of the deregulation of the planning system um, through the white paper, that are all the things he talks about, quite frankly, with permitted development rights, have actually seen the nosedive in the quality of um, genuinely affordable homes. Um, this isn't difficult, right? This isn't difficult. What do communities want? Well, they want nothing more radical than the ability to live in a genuinely affordable home with a decent living income, where their families can live long and happy lives of happiness, identity, a sense of belonging and love. Um, and it's not the role of the public um, the sector. It's not the role of local authorities. And it's certainly not my role um, to allow more exploitative practices to continue. Um, the, the public want the system to be accountable, um, say, for the, um, for example, the delivery of the 14,000 homes given planning permission in the London Borough of Ealing that are not yet built. Um, they want the system to be accountable so that we ensure that flippers and the land value merchants who extract profit from land but without sort of building squat um, are held accountable for their role in blocking the ability of London to build the genuinely affordable homes that it needs. Um, and ultimately, what we've demonstrated in Ealing through our estate regeneration programme and the use of um, uh, uh, estate ballots in which we've enfranchised people and given them power to control the destiny of what happens in their communities, actually, you unlock a different conversation because you put this person at the centre of your regeneration plans and you say, this is for you. This is your power. This is your community. Define that which it is that you want to achieve. And through a proper mature conversation in which you set out the challenges that we all face, both public and private sector, alongside the public, acknowledging the distress that they feel about the state of the economy and the state of London, um, we actually find the compromises that we need to build um, a better society. Because ultimately, um, we are not going anywhere. Um, the problem's not going anywhere. Um, so there's an awful lot of compromise that needs to happen in the system. I appreciate, there's always one, um, I appreciate the candid conversations we're having here. Um, we talk about housing as if it's kind of sometimes in London and other cities as if it's a nice to have. It's absolutely crucial, isn't it? And there are politics around it, um, as well as you know, issues about how do you just support other humans like yourself, as well as the environment. And that is political. How do you create jobs? How do you create the infrastructure? How do you make sure that people aren't excluded from the whole housing property and affordable housing, as you've all mentioned? So I think there's quite a few questions here um, that other people will have. We're going to hopefully open up some conversations through questions um, coming through, and I hope we'll get to answer some of those. But Gerard, would you like to say anything? Hello, yes, thank you very much, Maria. Um, so my name is Jared. I'm an associate director at MPC, and we deal with the communications and engagement on um, uh, projects coming forward in the built environment. 
Um, I think I was asked to discuss uh, about early engagement and, and how important you are. Yes. it is um, when it comes to applications coming forward. Um, and I think at MPC and across, across the industry, you know, we would always advise that early engagement is a fundamental piece for any proposals coming forward. Um, and that is partly because, you know, operating within the planning system that we do, there are a lot of unknowns and a lot of variables. Um, and often we won't know what the priorities are for an application until we get out there and we ask the questions. Um, so, you know, the earlier you ask these questions, the more time that it affords everybody to consider the feedback that we receive and the responses that we provide so we can hopefully create that uh, a feedback loop effectively so that we're not making this a one-way street where we're, we're taking feedback in we're providing responses to it we're trying to find um build those relationships which ultimately um is what will lead to constructive conversations and create that collaborative environment that will drive that uh, community cohesion piece um now I'd say that as you know, as well as timing, it's very important for us to consider what are the appropriate questions to be asking um, when we go out to these consultations. What decisions can communities be asked to influence? Um, what parameters are we providing to make sure that this is that, that we can ensure successful outcomes to this community conversation, if you like? We also need to consider very carefully, I would say, and and it has been put eloquently uh, by my fellow panelists that, you know, we need to think about who we're speaking to here. Um, in London, we have a very, very broad demographic of people. And the issue that we often find is that when we go out to have these conversations, um, you know, the first respondents, if you like, are generally from a, a very specific background. You know, we're talking generally, you know, an older responder, um, often retired, often homeowners themselves. So we're only really hearing um, in that initial conversation, sometimes the one perspective. And we need to find a plurality of views to make sure that the developments coming forward are right for all Londoners, for people who live within that community. Um, so we really need to make sure that that is a, like I say, that feedback loop and we continue to get out there and have these genuine conversations with as broad a demographic as possible to ensure that all of the perspectives are feeding into this proposal so that we're not careering towards you know the submission of a planning application for example or the determination of a planning application without hearing those views that are vitally important for the community that live in that area um, and that conversation has to extend as well um, you know post determination post planning consent um, these are communities that will be in existence hopefully for years and years and years and people will live there work there you know that will be their home and these Developments can provide substantial improvements to people's health, people's well-being, people's wealth. Um, and so, I mean, essentially, like I say, it, it seems like it's a fairly straightforward process, but it's always important to remember that it's not only going out at the right time. It's about asking the right questions. And it's about um, making sure that you're speaking to as broad a demographic as possible to achieve the outcomes for that community who live there and drive that community cohesion piece. Thank you. Um, something we, someone as met, we've mentioned before briefly was about social value regeneration. And we've got a couple of kind of questions I think we need to look at. And if someone can help me with questions that are coming from the audience, that, that would be great. I mean, you all talked about support that's needed. Um, we absolutely know that it's crucial. We know that let's say, you know, let's be absolutely honest right now, housing is unfair um, in most boroughs. And what we're all trying to do especially you and your jobs, is stopping that. But um, how do we, what, when we talk about these affordable targets, do we have the right ones and, and how do we meet those? And are you coming up with anything different? Um, I could do it head teacher like and ask you to put your hands up, but I'm just, just going to go first to Grace and then to Darren. That's a, oh, Darren, you put your mute off. So let's go to Darren and then to Grace. Well, the reason why I put my mute off is because we're not doing what the government's asking us to do. Because actually, government wants you to uh, be very prescriptive. When, when you're working with your community, you've got to be reactive to their needs, to their understanding of the situation. So it's quite interesting. Look, my fellow two uh, colleagues on this call, uh, and Gerard saying he, he's worked in Bean Park. Let me give you a, let, let, I can talk about Bean Park, and then I talk about what great work my colleagues are doing. 
And it's not that councils don't want to facilitate the ambitions of their community and the ambitions of developers and builders and because we know the world has to make money. Um, uh, so, but what we've got to do is be honest about the situation we find ourselves in. And honestly, there is not enough grant to build the homes that are truly affordable for London to prosper in the way it has done for centuries. London started and is still majority a renting city. What we've done though, is because we've restricted the amount of build that we could do for many different reasons uh, over a 40 year period, we've actually stopped the commercialization of London in a way that it is as a world city. London doesn't compete with anywhere else in the UK. London competes on a global stage. And what makes London so brilliant, and uh, it was very well put together by Peter, uh, and Grace mentioned it as well, is our diversity. I mean, we have the best diversity of any global city, and we should be very proud of that. But what, we're all now what we also now have, though, is the inability for people to prosper in this great city. The barriers are too high, whether it's in a class or ethnic background, that is a real problem. Mm -hmm. and, and we need governments to do their job. First, to put the right grant money that needs to go in. I live on the Beckentry estate. If you don't know it, then you shouldn't be in the building industry. It was the first of its kind uh, 100 years ago, and we've replicated it ever since. In fact, it was the largest housing, council housing estate ever built, 27,000 homes. But they put all the parks in, they put all the schools in, they put the doctor's surgeries in, they made sure that the transport systems were there, the schools were there, everything. We knew that. They knew that. Now, they did that in 12 years with Awesome Car. We, as local borough leaders, with our own companies, because we can't build in the HRA anymore, because as soon as you do, it gets taken away from you because it's the right to buy, which is a ridiculous business model. You can't sell something at a third of its true value and expect to make a profit. It never will work. It was a broken model 50 years ago. It's an exceedingly broken model today. So we have our own companies where we actually run rent at different levels starting at the lowest rents of council-based rent, all the way up to 80% of market rent, and sometimes now market rent, because okay. some people can afford that. So it's about getting a collective uh, development. That's why we're built in B&D. We've built 2, 000, over 2,000 homes in four years. Okay. I'm gonna... Local people. So it's really important, that, and this goes to Bean Park, the government pulled the funding on the train station for Bean Park that those residents in Havering moved there for because they were Thank told you. that that infrastructure was there and then it got pulled. OK, so so Grace, what's your um, feelings about infrastructure being pulled, but, but also, you know, things around um, the conversation around how are we actually... Um, looking at diversity in such a wide range, um, you know, how does that work for you when you're trying to figure out how you house people and make sure those housings are fit for purpose? And you talked a little bit earlier about, you know, some of the housing you're doing, which is more around cohesive communities and targets. I guess our question also should be thrown back at the real estate sector. How is it best for them to actually work with you? I mean, Peter, Grace, um, you know, Gerard, Darren, you all mentioned the issue about actually, you know, how does the real estate sector work and how does politics or aside from politics, how does government make sure that you can do your job? So, Grace. Thanks, Maria. Um, look, I think that London boroughs work extremely well to sort of get opportunities in, work in partnership with developers, you know, develop the mixed use uh, and brilliant places that we need but you know I've got to agree with Darren this is really political you know London is uh is sort of in some ways uh you know it's an area where we have the greatest uh inequality and the greatest wealth at the same time and that leaves us in a really difficult position as government sets up sets out its uh you know leveling up agenda because it's basically seeing London um, as an area of wealth, whereas we know in our boroughs uh, that it's the area of greatest inequality. 
So, you know, the quandary we've got is that we're totally prepared to work in partnership, public private partnership to deliver the homes that are needed. But it's a drop in the ocean. You know, I grew up in South East London. My parents actually moved eight times in the first year that I was born, you know, between squats and various places. Um, and then they were able to buy a small house which cost twelve thousand pounds in sort of about 1978. So, you know, look at the change that that means for families growing up. You know, where I was growing up, we had families who moved in uh, and bought big houses and shared them between each other because it was such a poor area where I lived in New Cross. And we now have a massive number of people who are priced out of the market. So, you know, I suppose the practical answer is we need more grants. You know, we need more um, we need more practical help from the GLA who are excellent, but we just need more investment to bring forward development. But the longer term answer is we need government to have a different approach, which recognises the place in housing in causing inequality. Thank you, Grace. Um, Peter, would you like to just respond to that? Meanwhile, I'm going to look at other questions coming through from the audience. Yeah, look, I mean, um, you know, as, as Darren and sort of, of, of Grace have sort of outlined, like part of the challenge here is just that, you know, here we are, sort of local authority people and, and developers sort of sitting together to try and sort of figure this out. But actually, like the, the levers are not really in, in, in much of either of our control. Um, you know, we, we, we've had, I mean, you know, uh, the housing benefit subsidy, you know, this is a huge privatisation of, of government capital. You know, this is government money, taxpayer money, flowing into the hands of people effectively paying down buy-to-let mortgages um, or a different way of putting money through um, the system for local authorities um, um, through housing benefits, subsidise our housing revenue accounts effectively. And, you know, wouldn't it be better, wouldn't it be far better if that type of money was instead diverted to local authorities to subsidise the homes that we that we need to build um, at the rates that we need to build them that are fundamentally genuinely affordable, right? Um, because if we're, as developers and local authorities constantly locked into an argument that, you know, fighting over the scraps in a viability agreement between 35% and 40% and quantums of social homes versus um, shared ownership and, you know, the quality of the build and um, the good bits that you get on the sides for um, biodiversity and regreening, et cetera, then, you know, we're locked into this argument and the public just look on it and think, you're all mad, the system's not working and you're fighting over the scraps. So, you know, government do have to step up, right? This is political. This is about saying the answer isn't in further deregulation of the planning system. I know that's going to disappoint some of you, right? But we don't need a further bonfire of the planning rules that, again, puts just more power in the hands of, quite frankly, um, you know, developers to extract land value than it does putting, um, you know, food on the table and roofs over the head of the people who who need them most. And you have to examine that within the context of um, uh, the context of London. Grace is completely right. Look, the leveling agenda, the leveling up agenda, is all very well and good for other parts of the country. But what it doesn't do is it doesn't speak to the huge numbers of people who are already facing that huge barrier of inequality in, in London. The council estate that I grew up on was built in the 1950s of concrete fabricated blocks whacked up after the war in order to deal with the slums of the inner cities of um, the Midlands. Um, that estate has never changed, right? It's still exactly the same now as it was um, in the 1950s, yet Friary Park and some of our council estates in London have been turned over three times to become more dense um, to be able to reprovide social homes um, in certain parts of London in that same time period. Um, and what we're forever going to see is this story of London's inequality fueling a consistent turnover and churn, uh, of the creative destruction of so much of the parts of our city, unless we're really able to fundamentally change some of the, the, the baseline things that are impacting the housing market. So number one, it's got to be subsidy. Number two, it's got to be about dealing with London's overheated um, uh, overheated uh, high paid jobs market, not its low paid jobs market. Um, and we have to do something about how we as London councils work with the communities that invariably end up taking the displaced of London, those who are forced out of the city because there is literally nothing left for them um, to be able to afford either on housing benefit, um, social homes, um, and, and are pushed out of the city because of, of the challenges that we face. So, you know, actually, this has to be a collaborative collaboration between those who are delivering and those who are the ones looking after the interests of the public. 
and we actually need, um, uh, you know, wouldn't that be radical? You know, developers, you know, get on board the campaign, get on board the campaign to tell the government that they need to release um, hundreds of billions of pounds for um, investment in building modern, fit-for-purpose, genuinely affordable council homes. I'd be interested. So- that, that is interesting. Um, and I'm going to come to Gerard in a minute, but I, I, I'm kind of interested in you mentioned that. I mean, I'm sure some of us will know many real estate in, as individuals or organisations and, you know, quite decent and, and have actually, you know, the same opinion of us quite often when having this conversation around creating better housing and homes for people. I, I think that's what they want too. But how, how do we make that happen? How do we do this collaboration that we're talking about? How do we get the real set, real estate sector to support you, some of the bigger real estate organisations or companies, how would they work together um, with or without um, governments' conversations around um, you know, levelling up? We've always been talking about levelling up and we're talking about housing if we're doing it right. And we've always been talking about inclusivity. Um, but how do we do that hand in hand if you were to create a partnership now with a, a real estate, large real estate company? What would be your first starter on that? I'm going to go to Gerard, and then I'm going to, if anyone um, from White Label can help me, colleagues, about questions that are coming from outside, let me know. So, Gerard. Sure. Uh, I mean, I think, Darren, do you, do you want to jump in on that first, and then I'll follow up? Well, I should do, as it's my job, uh, <laughs> the London Councils. So, thanks for that, Maria. Um, so, we already are talking to the sensible, the responsible house builders. Uh, Tony Pidgeley, God bless him, uh, he was very much on this agenda. Uh, He drove a hard bargain, but you know what? He understood community. And um, I can tell you now that I'm working with 10 of those said companies, I won't say which ones, uh, on asking what their issues are from local, from their perspective on local councils. And at the same time, we're we're looking, and I, this afternoon I meet with all 32 leads uh, of London for housing uh, to, again, discuss uh, what we can do to facilitate their ambition. So one of the things we all get told about is the 106 agreement. We, uh, we've said to them, right, show us what could be generic across all 32 boroughs. So rather than to redo a 106 agreement, from scratch every single development in every single borough let's see what we can generalize and then what is the specifics so if we can get 70 75 percent of the 106 agreement agreed across 32 boroughs because it's just general stuff you know it actually saves money with the lawyers it actually Mm -hmm. improves the efficiency when it goes through planning so we are listening collectively leaders are there our job is to lead our communities respecting what's there as well but we also and i go back to peter's point about the planning we don't need government to tear up the planning rule book there's 1.1 million properties that could be built in this country today right a quarter of a million of those could be built in london they've already got planning where the problem is is when the planning isn't then moved on to build And what we have asked as London councils to government is the ability to have what we call CPO plus, where actually we could go with a private developer that we trust, that know that they have the values of our respective communities and say to government, we can build this out in 12 months. We now want that land back at pre-planning values so we don't get stung by it, pre-planning values, and actually we will put the plan in and we will do it and start it in 12 months. Now, we're prepared to do that with the private sector. What that does is it actually says to all the good builders out there, we'll work with you. But all the cowboys, and there are cowboys, the land bankers, and they are, there are, and I, I always get, oh, there's none. Well, I can I can tell you where I've had sites where it was 26 million, it went over to 100 million, it got sold for after they got planning. You know, we've got to stop this because all it's doing is destroying London's ability to be a world city and delivering the outcomes that we need every type of Londoner to benefit from, from the lowest paid uh, upwards. Thank you. Thank you. So it's possible to work with, work with real estate and with local authorities and communities, but we've got to have you know, an issue that got to get our heads around making sure it's inclusive and it's not just about the book. OK, Ger- Gerard. Yeah, I think that, <clears throat> there's some really uh, interesting points being made there, I think. 
but it's fascinating to hear you know the efforts that local authorities are going to 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 deliver housing given they're under such constraints here right we 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 spoke about the politics briefly um you know i think let's to put it bluntly it, we we're 12 years into this government now i think we're on our sixth or seventh housing minister um you know we we're constantly promised improvements and change and yet we've got the situation where for example you know theresa may was our prime minister saying she was going to deliver for the just about managing and and it was all about you know improving those health wealth well-being outcomes delivering the housing that we needed fast forward a couple of years and she's the backbencher uh, you know kiboshing whatever that housing white paper was going to be because her residents didn't like the idea of increasing the housing within her constituency now that kind of um those sorts of political pressures have really halted what we're able to do um from a, a planning perspective to deliver those housing needs for the communities that are, you know desperately crying out for them within london we've managed to get ourselves into a situation where people are not only finding it difficult to move here which is uh, you know it's a city that lots of people do want to move to the opportunities there are amazing you know it's an incredible city to live in um but we've created a situation where people can't even afford to live in their own communities the ones that they've grew up in they get into a point where they you know they get their jobs they they've maybe graduated from university whatever it may be and they're looking to find their own feet and yet they're having to move away from their families um and the communities that they grew up in um i think as long as we maintain this situation and effectively we need a strong leadership if we're going to do this nationwide like I said local authorities particularly in london are doing a massively uh, impressive job in making sure they deliver for their communities but if we are to extend this out we need to make sure that for example a chesham and amersham by election isn't the final death now in a reform to planning policy it makes no sense and it's far too important an issue to allow that sort of um, parochial politics to dictate the direction of travel Okay, thank you. So, no parochial no politics, Catherine. Do we have any questions? We do. We do. Thank yes, you. Indeed. Um, so, we've got a few, but I'll, I'll just uh, I'll table a couple, and then um, Ray, you can decide who you'd like to answer them. So, first of all, any thoughts on the need for rent controls to facilitate balanced, balanced communities and levelling up within London, indeed within all of our cities? Housing benefit and other support is broadly inaccessible to the lower-paid singletons. That's so important to the economy. And then there's one around um, cost for the construction industry in terms of the, the increase in traffic charges that have been imposed. Um, a comment's been made that particularly for smaller builders and contract contractors, this is causing an issue and they are therefore avoiding central London sites. What can be done to remove these unfair charges while keeping the zero carbon agenda? Over to you. Okay, <laughs> so his head. <laughs> so there's quite a few questions there. Um I'd like to throw one into the pot as well because we've talked about um commercial sector the commercial um re- estate real estate um sector but I'm also wondering how you work with other sectors. I mean increasingly you're finding philanthropists and and foundations looking at how they can support housing and that's my day job and I'm kind of interested you know if you were working with a foundation or a wealthy individual um how would you work with them and how will you get them involved to say you know this is why we need your support have you done that before and then i'd like to come to the question about rent control but how do we get other people at the table making sure you can build those houses despite what you might think about funding and um yeah charity having to support housing but maybe that is required well it is um i'll go to peter um I'll, I'll answer them um, three really really quickly um okay. first so the first one is we already have rent controls right effectively which is um uh the um housing um uh, hra increases so you know, the reason that we've got like billions of pounds worth of pension fund money pouring into london to support the built to rent sector is because um institutional investors want a stable return on investment and if you can do that off yields of sort of you know 2% and you're happy to lock that into the system obviously with inflation going and and potentially interest rates going up that might put a bit of a challenge into the system 
But, you know, the financial institutions are already happy to lock in a 2% inflationary um, uh, uh, yield um, into their financial models and are de- doing deals with councils for 40, 50 years on income strips. So look, if the system's happy to lock in themselves a um, rental cap, then I don't see why we shouldn't be able to therefore apply it to the rest of the uh, private rented sector. And certainly it will help put a, um, a cap on, on some of the worst excesses of uh, land value lift in, in certain parts of um, of London. Um, the, I mean, the, the the last question I'll say, look, um, we'd love to actually, I mean, the, I'd love to talk to the Earl of Jersey, um, who's a major landholder in um, the London borough of Ealing. I understand um, he was in, uh, he's in London right now. He's come over from Jersey uh, because he was spotted at Osterley, um, uh, Osterley Station. He has a field. I'd really love to regrow and rewild that field to put in um, uh, to place uh, London's largest urban rewilding um, uh, uh, centre, um, and if he has a conversation with us about that, and he wants to um, contribute to it, then maybe we'll have, be able to have a conversation about other bits and pieces. Um, but you know, um, we're we're open um, we're open for a conversation always. Okay, so that's that's an open shout out to landowners and philanthropists to get on board and work with us. Um, I know that's something that, that I do with the Foundation Future London, looking at capital as well as revenue programmes. And I think you know, more foundations need to do that. Um, I'm just trying to make sure that we answer some of those questions that came through from the outside audience. Can, How can, about... Maria, can I go on to one with the uh, uh, pollution? Yes, please do. Uh, yeah. All right, because yeah. I've, I've got to be honest, I, I, I find it quite amazing that people are complaining about trying to save the planet. Um, I mean, we've got a real issue here. I live in one of the worst air quality areas of the country, not even of London, but of the country. Uh, Peter mentioned about how women were dying 15 years younger in his area. Well, for every stop on the, from the city to East London, a, a year less of your life happens, right? So actually from West London to East London, it's actually 20 years difference. We've got the... Uh, the fact because of the air quality i have no problem with the green agenda i've gone from two diesel cars down to one electric car now when i listen to business talk about it hold on a minute i can't go to the tax man and claim back my driving costs they can so whether you're parking in london whether you're paying a charge to come into london or whether it's mileage as long as you have a profitable business The tax you'll pay government is less because you will claim it back. So in effect, there is no additional charge to you as a business because you can claim it back from the tax man. No citizen of London can do that in their private, private way. They are the ones who actually pay the charge, not business. So we've got to be very careful here. So I'd go if you're if you're not claiming it back, I'd ask your accountant to do their job properly because you can. And I say that as an ex-businessman. Um, so so um, that's not even uh, an issue. As for uh, housing benefit, uh, quite frankly, it's not enough. And I agree, we are not building enough for singletons, as it's been put here. Um, we do need to build more, but we can only do that if the subsidy is there in the first place, as Grace was saying. The GLA gives us the subsidy, but the GLA gets the money from government. Yeah. And if the money's not there, we can't build it. We want to. But actually, we have no statutory requirement to help single people any longer, which is a mistake. We should have, but we need the money to follow to make a sustainable community and a fair one. Thank you. So we need more funding for homes for singletons, but we also need more money for homes for multi-generational families. And working in East London, I I know that's really a big issue for many people. Um, Grace, would you like to respond um, to the issue around environment and making sure that actually we protect the environment in a way that that doesn't um, cause economic problems for individual households with low incomes? But we do as a city, don't we? Um, have to protect the environment. Um, that's absolutely crucial. But Grace, what, what are your thoughts on that? Thanks, Maria. Yeah, so I think there's a real danger that, um, you know, low traffic neighbourhoods, for example, has just become a culture war. You know, it's become a sort of proxy war after uh, Brexit and all the other culture wars we're seeing. You know, let's be really clear. 
the people who are most impacted by uh, environmental issues, air quality, are the poorest people um, in London. And we saw that uh, with the recent case of, um, you know, the the child in in South London um, who died as a result of air quality. One thing I'm really proud of is we've just commissioned Michael Marmot um, to uh, do a study into health inequalities. And I think that one thing it will show us is the link between, you know, where people live, air pollution um, and housing. So I think it's really important that, um, you know, we take note of what Darren said. You know, we have to push forward with the green agenda. We really have no choice. We really, it's not a choice for us. Um, One thing I'm really interested in, in our, um, in what we do next is to have an approach to uh, environment and climate, which focuses on our housing states. So our housing states are where we actually have more power to set out a green agenda, whether that's in terms of waste disposal, cycle, uh, parking, uh, you know, not creating uh, access uh, through and, and rat runs through our estates, but also um, re- uh, retrofitting and making sure that we're doing the very best that we can in terms of energy efficiency and access to fair energy as well. So, you know, actually, I think we need to put our housing states right at the centre of what we're doing um, on the green agenda. Um, yeah, I mean, I think sticking to the green stuff, you know, that that's really where we need to go with this. Thank you. Uh, it strikes me as well that we need to also make sure that we're looking after green spaces. We don't lose our parks and we create more inclusive spaces that, that everyone in the community can, can be part yeah, of. I, would, I think that's really important, Maria, but I would just say, you know, that basically councils won't build over green spaces we you know we continue to protect them and to enhance them for example you know we've worked with um, Thames Water in our area to make uh, the wetlands um, accessible so I think you know obviously communities sometimes misunderstand uh, uh, what councils can do on green spaces but we need to show that we are protecting those green spaces yeah absolutely by law we're not allowed to touch them no that's the point we can't touch them even if we wanted to and actually we don't want to we want to invest in them but exactly. because our lump, our budgets have been cut so severely by national government and i know people go oh poor poor councils will you try and operate a business where when you had a pound in 2010 you've only got 35p of it today and you've got to keep 28 green spaces operational and it, you know, you've got to find ways. And what, again, what you're seeing with the wetlands is fantastic. It's, it's a brilliant space for people to be inspired. And that's what we try and do. We try and inspire our residents in the locations where they live. But we've got to do that on housing estates as well as nice, uh, nice green spaces like the wetlands. Now, that's probably not a bad place to sort of wrap up because we, we do need to be ambitious, don't we? And we need to make sure we protect the local environment and local communities. But I think what you've all been saying is that you know, the real estate sector um, can play a, a strong role in the work that you're doing and making sure that actually we have homes and houses for people um, because that is the right thing to do. It's the most basic thing that a human expects and we should be able to deliver um, I'll see with Catherine if there's any last questions or anything you think could help with the wrap up. Um, no, I mean, I think that was a fascinating conversation. Um, and thank you to everybody for taking part this morning. Um, I just want to flag what we've got coming up. There's loads more happening um, over today and tomorrow. Um, so I think I'm just going to have a couple of slides just to tell you where we're heading next. Um, so we're off to Ealing um, next. Um, and then we'll be looking at uh, talking about the next generation at 12 o'clock. And then looking at the, the life science sector um, at two o'clock. And then on to tomorrow, we have another fully packed day uh, looking at North Finchley, even looking at the African opportunity, gardening communities, and what role does the state sector play in levelling up? So there's still loads more discussions happening over today and tomorrow. A reminder to anybody that's watching uh, that you can book all of, or all of those on for free on the website. So please do head to that if you want more information. Uh, but for now, thank you very much um, to Maria. Uh, to the rest of the panel, uh, to Darren, to Grace, uh, to Peter, to Gerard. Thanks so much for your contribution and we look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.